Normally, once I realize the show I'm watching is bad, I do what most others do and quit watching it, deeming my time to be too valuable to waste any further and perhaps lamenting that which was already lost. Usually this takes several episodes to realize, but Rings of Power has proven to be a special case. For after a single episode, I found myself thinking it less likely to become entertaining or coherent than Chris Christie winning a marathon or Hunter Biden breathing in a plant that hadn't already been processed into a fine white powder. It's good because it's cocaine! <gasps> and little kids eat it? And yet here I am again for another spoonful of Amazon Prime sludge, knowing full well how it is likely to taste going down and with more than a hint of trepidation as to what it will introduce into my bloodstream. However, not all curiosity here is entirely so morbid. Some of my interest in coming back for more is in relation to the substance of the show itself. Granted, I'm about as invested in the plot and characters as Mark Hamill is in his granddaughter, but I am at least curious if Rings of Power has already bottomed out, or if the worst is yet to come. Now, the latter of these possibilities is something I find difficult to fathom. As stated in my first video on the series and upon reflection since then, it is the worst first episode of any show I have ever seen, though it is not the worst piece of media. Granted, some of the movies or series I would rank beneath it lacked some of the advantages of a large budget, such as the superficial oohs and ahs of good special effects. But worse writing, acting, directing, and other such things do exist, so it is therefore feasible that Rings of Power has yet to complete its descent. Or I could be wrong and the show could get better. If its worst days are in fact behind it, then just how far out of the hole can Rings of Power dig itself? Is there an episode or two which I could at some point acknowledge as the best of the series and mean that as a compliment rather than a concession? Could episode two possibly be a candidate for such a label? Will it at least be an improvement upon its predecessor? Or am I about to tow the rim of another high ledge and make comparisons between this show's quality and the sweet release only gravity can offer? Certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? Episode two, called Adrift, begins with a new title sequence, complete with a track composed by Howard Shore, the man responsible for the score to Peter Jackson's cinematic trilogy. And it's a solid piece of music, probably the best the series has to offer thus far. As for the sequence itself, I get the suspicion they were attempting to compete with something like Game of Thrones' opening titles, and while it's not bad looking, I think it fails to measure up. Aside from the music, it seems more reminiscent of a tech demo or the opening to a soap opera, just with a bit more money spent on it. Now while I am poking fun, I still realize that I'm speaking purely from a place of preference so you can rest assured that I'm not going to count this aspect of the show against it. I'm commenting on it simply because it is a new element of the show that I'm seeing for the first time. But if it is such a bother, I am aware that I can skip it for subsequent episodes. But now it's time for part two's tale to begin, and it earns its name within the first few seconds, picking up where we left off with Galadriel, who just abandoned the ship meant to carry her to the Undying Lands so she could continue her hunt for Sauron. She is alone in the dark and at sea with no shore or help in sight. She gets her directional bearings by looking upon the stars, then turns and begins to swim. And scene. Wait, that's it? What was the point of showing us this? The previously on montage before the title sequence already reminded us where we left off with her. No progress has been made in her journey, nor any new danger or solution has presented itself. It's not the world-breaking nonsense of episode one's opening minutes, mind you, but it was still a waste of 37 seconds. <gasps> That's what she said? <laughs> we come back to Nori the Harfoot, where we last left her as well, staring down at the nearly naked man before being given a fright by Poppy. After some mutual scolding, Nori is accidentally pushed into the fiery crater in as convincing a fashion as a flagrant foul committed against LeBron James. No worries though, for as our little hero immediately observes, the fire isn't hot. She crawls her way toward the old man and observes that he seems to be lacking in protein intake, which I take to mean that he's been partaking in the blasphemy. And for that reason, as well as my suspicion of his true identity, I shall refer to him as V. Gandalf. Nori pokes at V. Gandalf to see if he's still alive, turns away for a moment, then he awakens and grabs her by the wrist. <laughs> There's a short display of magic and some dramatic music, but then the narcolepsy kicks back in and down goes the gray man. 
Now, I suppose I can give some credit to this little sequence for not being the same waste of time as the opening scene. Though like a young former Disney starlet now trying to make it in the mainstream show business, it has its fair share of issues. I already noted how silly it looks when Poppy almost commits manslaughter against her friend, but exacerbating the moment is their lack of reactions to it. Poppy is never shown appearing relieved that she didn't just kill or severely injure her friend, and when Nori announces that the fire isn't hot, neither one of the ladies take a moment to be surprised by the fact, despite the astonishing nature of it. And if you're inclined to argue that this world is magical and therefore wouldn't be such a surprise, I would point you back to episode one where even one of the elves in Galadriel's company took note of how bizarre this is. My hand is past feeling. Now, if a well-traveled elf is in shock, then a long-sheltered Harfoot should be positively baffled. Speaking of that bit in episode one... This place is so evil, our torches give off no warmth. <laughs> yes, we're back to them trying to convince us that V. Gandalf here is our big baddie. Now, I've already gone over why that is a silly notion, and not because I already know Sauron's true identity. To refresh anyone's memory who might have forgotten, V. Gandalf arrived encased in a meteor, and did so only minutes ago in the show's timeline. Sauron, on the other hand, has already fought and killed on Middle-earth, and then went missing for centuries. Now, I'm obviously not surprised they're keeping up the ruse, and fully expect them to continue to do so until the big reveal proves it wrong. But it's amusing all the same. Now back to Poppy. This is thus far the most we've seen from her in terms of character, as in the previous episode she did little more than fall face first into the mud. And I'm afraid her performance here is wildly overdone. Her movements are jerky, the line delivery sloppy, and the dialogue they've written for her is pretty bad. Well, Poppy's a little sloppy. <laughs> By contrast, Nori's actress Markella Cavanaugh is doing more or less okay, that nightmarish reaction notwithstanding but her characterization remains entirely one note, as the show continues to point out how adventurous she is. That's not much to go on. Staying with the Harfoots, we're next shown Sadak, Nori's mother, and Malva. Malva? One of the older Harfoot ladies from the previous episode. They whisper to one another about hearing the meteorite crash, and Malva... Malva? ...suggests that it's another sign that they should pack up and migrate as soon as possible. But Sadak responds by saying that they won't do anything rash, though he agrees this does not bode well and that they should keep their eyes open. After sending the ladies away, we see some items get snatched away from the camp and Sadak just misses seeing who did it. This is, of course, Nori and Poppy taking items they'll need to help V. Gandalf. Though we'll get to them in a moment because, once again, we have some problems. First, going by the manner in which Sadak and the ladies were speaking, the meteorite crash must have only just occurred within the past few minutes. And given the fact that Nori and Poppy were at the site and yet managed to run back in that time frame, we can deduce from this that the crash was quite close to the Harfoot encampment. So then, how did no other Harfoots hear this? Heck, I'm wondering if they shouldn't have felt it given their proximity. Sadak and the ladies shouldn't need to whisper at all. The crash of that meteor should have awoken everyone nearby, not just a convenient selection of them. And yet it appears the Harfoots have either discovered the wonders of Ambien, or they have the alertness of Joe Biden at the Glasgow summit. He's asleep! Nori and Poppy are now carrying V. Gandalf in a cart, wondering what exactly he is, be it a man, or elf, or giant, or some other such thing. In the morning, we'll pack him up some food and send him on his way. He'll wash away. That's a tomorrow problem. Not an uncommon phrase there, but believe it or not, I'm actually going to compliment its usage and acknowledge it as kind of charming. It's a well-delivered and utilized line, though my main reason for bringing it up is because in a moment, we'll get a less favorable comp for it. The two continue to bicker, with Poppy suggesting that while Nori refuses to walk away from this, V. Gandalf could be a threat to them. Not just in that he could be a dangerous individual, but if it is discovered that they help this person, then they will be blamed if anything goes wrong in the seasons to come. Hmm. A superstitious lot of people turning on a pair of do-gooders for inviting in an outsider after some calamity befalls the community? 
Is the show simply offering up a possibility as to where things might go, or are we actually foreshadowing that which will occur? I ask because I do think there is some potential in this idea if it is done right. It is long since we had any hope. As the ladies shelter the big man, Poppy asks Nori why she is doing this. Nori explains that he could have landed anywhere, but did so here of all places. And she believes that this and her finding him happened for a reason. She therefore cannot walk away from it until she knows he is safe. I do suppose I can sort of see her reasoning here because it is true that him arriving so close to their community, or any civilization for that matter, would be difficult to dismiss as mere coincidence. And I'm not even suggesting that as a negative contrivance of the shows, for even Tolkien's lore and other beloved pieces of media have insinuated the guiding hand of a greater power before. Yet while I'm forgiving of the long odds of Nori's situation right now, I still have to comment on the poor dialogue which is horribly generic for a moment that seems to want to resonate with the audience. This is that unfavorable comp I was talking about. Like the Tomorrow Problem line, Nori is delivering dialogue here that many movies and stories have before, which is that everything happens for a reason. And I understand that making such a declaration can be difficult to make interesting and impossible to make seem original, but this appears to have been written in the most cookie-cutter way imaginable. I seem to recall the Lord of the Rings facing a similar problem when Sam gives a speech in the Two Towers, which ultimately ends with him declaring that there's some good in this world and that it's worth fighting for. This is not in any way an uncommon sentiment in life or storytelling, and yet despite how common it is, there might very well be no more beloved example of this declaration in all of media. And why? Because it was well written and well delivered by the actor. And on top of that, Sam was a well-established character from whom these words felt believable. Now, I do think in this instance, Markella Cavanaugh is probably doing the best she can, but her efforts are unfortunately in vain. There's just too little in the actual words to make them feel personal to Nori rather than just a platitude. Perhaps if we knew her better, these lines might at least resonate a bit more beyond the words themselves. And I get the sense that we're establishing the, or at least a, primary motivation for this character for at least this season, so making this moment stand out should have been a high priority. From Nori falling into the crater to where we are now in the episode is about six and a half minutes in length, and never cuts away from the Harfoots. This line is the bookend to that time frame, and it lands with all of the grace of a legless cat. <coughs> But now we must leave the Harfoots in order to return to the loving duo of Arondir and Bronwyn, whom were last shown looking down upon the scorched earth of Hordern. The town appears deserted and the animals dead, and Bronwyn makes note of fissures in the ground such as those left during an earthquake. They search a nearby home which contains a dugout passage, which the elf understands to mean that this was not the result of an earthquake. <laughs> This was no ground shake. Someone dug this passage. Something. Men did not do this. Uh, how does she know that? Bronwyn is a nurse. Since when is excavation a part of that job's description? And what exactly gives away the fact that this wasn't dug by men? I don't know. Now, it's not impossible for her to figure this out if the show simply provided some kind of clue for her to spot. As we'll discover later in the episode, the hole and tunnels were dug by orcs and perhaps orcs are inclined to dig with their claws rather than tools. If Bronwyn had, say, spotted the fingernail of an orc claw embedded in the dirt nearby and then suggested that something other than men might have dug the passages, then this line makes a bit of sense. But instead, we're meant to accept that she simply knows because she knows. Now, putting aside Bronwyn's extensive tunneling knowledge, I think we need to consider the implications of what has been revealed about Hordern thus far. Now, given the fact that everyone is missing and the animals slain, and the fact that we have this hole dug out in this house, and the additional knowledge that those responsible for this are orcs, there appear to be just two possibilities. Either the orcs emerged from this hole and the people fled, or the orcs kidnapped them. And given the fact that they bothered to dig this hole in this house as their entry point, I think it's safe to assume that this attack or abduction was planned. So then, why are there fissures in the ground? Arondir has already specified that this wasn't an earthquake, so did a tunnel collapse coincide with this operation? That would certainly be a rather fantastic coincidence, would it not? Or did a sudden collapse force the orc's hand? 
also a big coincidence. Or are the fissures in the ground simply a pointless detail meant to add to the aesthetic of a ruined town? I cannot say for sure just now, yet I have a nasty feeling that the latter possibility will end up being the explanation, which is really no explanation at all. Go. Warn your people. You're not coming with me. I must follow the passage the other direction. You don't know what's down there. That is the reason I must go. You must go because you don't know? Whatever is in these tunnels either disappeared an entire town or forced them all to flee. What chance do you think you have against such an enemy on your own? And also, how can you be so certain that these tunnels actually lead to Bronwyn's town at all? The previous episode told us that from her home to Hordern was about a day's journey. On foot over uneven terrain, let's make a guess and say that that's somewhere between 10 to 20 miles. Now, I know the show is going to ensure that he's right about the tunnels leading back in that direction, but why is he right? What above ground indicates to him the exact direction and destination? particularly when the one he supposes is quite a ways from where they are standing. And if it does indicate this, why would he send the woman he loves alone and in the dark in that direction on such a long and potentially perilous journey? Is he not concerned her fate could rather easily be the same as the people of Hordern? And finally, are we ever to learn why that cow from the first episode had black goo coming out of its udders? You remember? The thing which led these two lovebirds here in the first place? Was that just a contrivance to make the plot happen? Bronwyn makes to leave, but a Rondier has her by the hand and holds on to her wrist, pulling her in close and... Nothing stops her. They just look at each other and then he jumps. So the show appears to be holding back when these two characters will deliver an on-screen smooch because it wants to build up to the moment. But they've already implied that these two have possibly gotten physical before. So why would they want to hold back now? I'm once again wondering if the writers simply haven't decided for themselves just how far this relationship has progressed. One minute it appears Arondir has probably rounded the bases and crossed home plate a few times, and the next one wonders if he's even given her the foul tip. Next we come to a new location called Oregion, though my spell check function insists that I'm meant to spell Oregon. But after a quick sweep for blue-haired elves running autonomous zones in the Elvish Kingdom, where I found no evidence of the fact, I rest assured now knowing that this is simply a programming error. We find Elrond with the greatest of elven smiths, of course, in his workshop, as he marvels over a hammer on display which we're told belonged to Feanor and wrought the famed Silmarils. They converse a bit about Feanor and the Silmarils and Morgoth, and admittedly I found myself enjoying this dialogue. It doesn't necessarily move the plot, but it deepens the lore, and while I'm not positive as to how accurate it is to Tolkien's The Silmarillion, I felt it enriched the world at least to some extent. Feanor's work nearly turned the heart of the great foe himself. What has Mile ever accomplished? I'm going to take a moment to compliment Charles Edwards here, because while I don't think he at all looks the part of a blacksmith, his acting is thus far pretty good. He doesn't have a lot of screen time in this episode, but he's utilizing it in a way that I like. But of course, as it has thus far been the case pretty much every time I like something in this show, it is immediately followed up by something I don't. It has turned my heart, my boy. All right, gay. You know, there's nothing wrong with one man appreciating the work of another man. In fact, it's rather common amongst fans of various sports. I'm something of an admirer of seven-time Super Bowl winner Tom Brady. And if I ever had the privilege to meet him, I absolutely would be inclined to share with him my admiration for the work he did on the field, and perhaps even express gratitude for all the happy memories he provided over the course of his more than two-decade career in the NFL. I would not, however, tell him that he had turned my heart. That's just cringe. It's the type of line that belongs with the likes of... You are in my very soul, tormenting me. Or, you know, just about any other line Anakin Skywalker spoke in Attack of the Clones. Celebrimbor states that he desires to do more than he's done, lamenting that their people had to bring war to these shores while he aspires to fill them with beauty. He wishes to move beyond Jewelcraft and devise something of real power. Elrond asks what, but the Great Smith tells him his concern is helping him with the how. He means to build a great tower which can host the most powerful forge ever built. Elrond asks what the difficulty is, and he's informed that it will need to be completed by the spring, which will require a workforce greater than any ever assembled. 
The High King could not provide Celebrimbor with this and instead gave him Elrond, who then asks if he is considered looking outside their race for help. So before we continue, why does our smith here require this to be done by spring? I don't know. That's a good question. And given the fact that King Gilgalad just declared in episode one that the days of war were over, why couldn't he provide such a workforce? I'm not asking these questions to necessarily point out a flaw, but I will be curious to see if either of these ever get an answer. Seems unlikely, but we can always hope. A brief Indiana Jones map shot follows from there, and it shows little dots moving from Eregion to the dwarvish dwelling of Casa Doom. And wow, that is quite a long distance they're covering. That's almost as long as one of the rivers on the map. How long did it take them to travel this far? Was this done over the course of just a few hours, or am I to believe that elves can teleport? Well, no time to think about that, as after a few nice establishing shots of mountains and streams, our duo arrives at Casa Doom, with Celebrimbor noting that achieving an alliance with the dwarves would be the diplomatic achievement of the century. Elrond, however, notes that their Prince Durin is an old and dear friend of his, almost like a brother. Isn't that sweet? Elrond tells him that not only will the prince likely allow such an audience, but also will welcome them open-armed with a great feast and vast quantities of alcohol. So in other words, your basic Irish funeral. But just as he says this, we get something of a Wizard of Oz scene. Who rang that bell? We did. Not going the way Elrond had hoped, he attempts to clarify that he is a friend, but is rebuffed again. Confused by this rejection, Elrond then invokes what he calls the Rite of Sigin Terag, and for this, the door opens. I guess that friend password wasn't implemented until later. Before entering, Elrond suggests Celebrimbor wait for him back in Eregion, and despite the latter's misgivings, to trust him on the matter. He is then led into the underground, and we are presented with all of the grand splendor of the Dwarvish Halls. And yes, it successfully achieves the desired sense of spectacle. Elrond is brought into a large room with an audience of many dwarves, and soon after, Durin himself arrives. Durin announces that Elrond has invoked the dwarven test of endurance, and the idea is that they both must continually break rocks with a hammer until one of them forfeits. Should Elrond lose, he will be banished from all dwarven lands forever, but if he wins, he'll be granted a single boon. And thus, Dwayne Johnson's nightmare begins. But before that can play out, we're back in Munchkinland with Nori, who's checking in on V. Gandalf. She finds him carving into a rock, and when she gets his attention, he reacts the same way I do when my phone rings. She manages to calm him down and attempts to communicate with him. I won't harm you. You won't harm me. Do you? Um, are we meant to believe he understood her proposal, or that he simply mimicked her gesture? She does a bit more signing to him, and now I have to ask how and why she knows how to do so. Is this common amongst Tarfoots? And if so, why are we only just seeing this example of it? It seems entirely out of nowhere. Well, according to an article I read on Decider.com, Markella Kavanaugh approached the showrunners with this idea that Harfoots would have nonverbal means to communicate in case of danger. Not a bad idea, but we've already seen an instance of the Harfoots believing they were in danger back when they were first introduced in episode one, and not a single usage of this sign language ever occurred, nor was it used when Nori spotted the animal track while looking after the children. Furthermore, V. Gandalf seems entirely capable of learning how to speak, so why not start with teaching him words? I understand one could argue that she's teaching him the sign language for the purpose of communicating danger when necessary, but the issue with that is the show hasn't informed us that this is the reason for its existence yet. And to be honest, given the lack of commitment to consistency or quality, I have my doubts about the show ever doing so or even showing another Harfoot using it. You never know. There's then a bit of cutting back and forth between Nori watching V. Gandalf right in the dirt while her father Largo, back at the Harfoot camp, is doing some manual labor. As these are occurring, there seems to be a connection between the two as if V. Gandalf's writing is having some kind of magical effect on Largo, and appears to confirm it when the stick V. Gandalf uses snaps while Nori's father's ankle breaks at the very same moment. And while V. Gandalf is fervently attempting to communicate something to Nori, Poppy comes and tells her that something has happened to her dear dad. 
Now, what occurs next is not only strange, but kind of disturbing. Largo is shown to have what appears to be a broken ankle, something I'm sure is quite painful. And this is obviously set in the equivalent of a time when treatments for such things were much more primitive. That said, broken bones have been treated in some form or fashion for thousands of years, and I imagine they would be nothing new to any people group, real or fictional. So while there are some concerns here for the injured party, the prognosis should in no way be grim at the moment. And yet, that's precisely how it's presented. Nori appears gloomy and a large portion of the camp stare at her as she exits their tent and begin inquiring about how bad it is, as if the man is dying from a battle wound. And then in a strange tonal shift, Malva, Malva states the apparently dour reality of his injury before getting scolded by Poppy, to which Malva, Malva? responds, um, are broken legs and ankles treated by Harfoots much the same as horses with broken legs are treated by vets? Is Largo going to be put down? And if so, are we meant to despise Malva? Malva. Or just laugh at her dottiness? Fuck. Moving along from that strange scene, we return to the sea where Galadriel is still swimming. Now, I am aware of some incredible feats by humans in the real world who have swum continuously for many consecutive hours, and I'm fine with the notion that elves might in general be so capable, or at least far more capable swimmers than humans, so at this point it's fine that she hasn't succumbed to fatigue. However, she certainly looks very tired here, and relative to where she leapt out of the boat in the previous episode, she can't have gone very far. Now let's add a bit of context to her situation at present. As far as I know, there is no exact scale for how large the Sundering Sea actually is, though one of its nicknames is the Great Sea, and a name such as this suggests that it is in fact one of the largest in Middle-earth, possibly even the largest. I looked up a list of our own largest seas, and the Adriatic Sea, which ranks number 76, is 138,000 square kilometers. The largest, the Philippine Sea, is 5.695 million square kilometers. And if we were to include oceans in the mix, the largest of those is the Pacific and it spans 63.8 million square miles. I think it's safe to say that wherever the Sundering Seas falls in this astonishing range, Galadriel's situation was beyond dire the moment she abandoned ship. And to add even more context to this, let's consider how far she swam at this point, keeping in mind that she's likely only been doing so for roughly half a day. Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps swam the 200 meter freestyle at a speed of roughly 4.7 miles per hour. Now, if we asked the showrunners how fast Galadriel could swim, I'd imagine they'd say she's faster even than him. We can't have her being slower than a man after all. So let's be insanely generous and grant her a full five miles per hour for the full 12 hours. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Even under those circumstances, Galadriel will have swam just 60 miles. She is still well out to sea with no realistic hope of making sure before succumbing to exhaustion or hypothermia or some kind of hungry sea creature. This means her only hope is a random passing boat and the odds of coming across one are preposterously low. Oh, well, would you look at that. What luck for our heroine, a randomly floating life raft. Isn't that convenient? Aren't you lucky? Galadriel cries out to the few people on board and swims over to them. A handsome gent comes before her and says, The tides of fate are flowing. Yours may be heading in. Or out. The passengers argue for a moment as to whether or not they will allow her aboard, and then one of the women offers her hand and pulls her up. They begin questioning how she came to be out here and if she has seen what one of them calls the worm. The helpful woman begins to tell how their boat was attacked and the less trusting man warns against telling Galadriel their affairs. But the woman asks if she looks dangerous to him, to which the handsome man who is off to the side declares, Looks can be deceiving. All right, I'm not going to make it any further without reiterating what I stated in the previous video I made about this show, which is that I know full well the identity of Sauron. So, spoiler alert, it's Discount Aragorn here. In this line is a little tidbit that you are meant to believe is innocuous now, but later, perhaps upon rewatch, recognized to be a cleverly masked hint at his true identity. 
Now, putting aside the silly idea that anyone with even a hint of good taste would watch this show again, unless of course they want to grow their channel, I'm genuinely curious as to who else thinks this line is too on the nose to achieve the writer's desired goal of hiding Sauron in plain sight. That is difficult for me to judge objectively since I knew beforehand. So if you happen to see this show, was this clue too overt or did you need a bit more to be certain? However, my main reason for letting you know that I was aware of Sauron's identity isn't this line of dialogue. I bring it up because we've come to what is thus far the most ridiculous plot contrivance of the show, and it is an absolute all-timer. A moment ago, I went over the odds of Galadriel coming across a boat or surviving at all once she abandoned ship. Now add to those odds the idea that she's not only come across a life raft, but that it would be holding the very foe she's been chasing for centuries. This is peak absurdity. It's one thing for V. Gandalf to land nearby the Harfoots and Nori. That situation certainly had to overcome long odds to occur, but there is still enough deniability that whatever greater power happens to be involved remains hidden from view. You may be aware you're watching a bit of a puppet show, but you cannot see the puppeteer or the strings being pulled. In other words, it isn't too difficult for me to suspend my disbelief in favor of that situation. This, however, is so convenient, so contrived, that the puppeteer and the strings are not only visible, but have signs adorned with bright lights to their sides pointing out the greater power responsible for it. They are not asking you to merely suspend your disbelief in order to accept that this could occur. They are asking that you abandon thinking altogether. I'm sure you've heard some form of the phrase, you have to turn your brain off to enjoy this, in relation to a piece of media before but you would be hard pressed to find an example so close to literal as this moment here. I do not know where exactly it would rank amongst other such ludicrous contrivances I've seen, but given the source from which it came, I cannot recall having felt so intellectually insulted by a show in my life. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are, if you are a person or one of the persons who came up with this, you should feel ashamed of yourself. You might be a swell person otherwise and even possibly have penned some fine lines or a book or script or poem before, but I sincerely hope that if ever and whenever you see this work of yours on screen, that you feel a profound sense of guilt and embarrassment and that for all of our sakes, it encourages you either to improve upon your craft or leave it entirely behind if this is all you're capable of. And if you ever happen to come across this video for some reason, I suggest it this time that you put on the cone of shame while the rest of us continue to examine this mess that you've left us. You go sit in the corner and think about what you've done. As the crew on the wreckage question Galadriel, one of them spots sails in the distance and for a moment they believe they are to be rescued. But as it draws closer, they recognize it to be the rest of the wreckage of their own ship and it's being towed by... <laughs> Not exactly a creative bunch when it comes to naming things, are we? Come on, guys, even SpongeBob did this better. In fact, let's rewind. But as it draws closer, they recognize it to be the rest of the wreckage of their own ship, and it's being towed by... An Alaskan Bullworm! Alaskan Bullworm attacks their wreckage, and while Sauron is shown detaching his portion of the raft from the rest, Galadriel is pushed back into the sea by one of the doomed passengers because they think she led it to them. The monster then kills this lot and swims away, leaving Sauron to rescue our drenched damsel. Can we please go to the next scene? We return to Casa Doom, where the endurance test between Durin and Elrond is nearing its end. And we see here that Elrond's expression is very much in line with my own while watching this show, though I think we know whose burden has been greater. Durin, meanwhile, still appears fit to keep going, and ultimately Elrond realizes he cannot win, and thus invokes the right of the nation of France. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. Elrond is told to take his leave and suggests the prince escort him to the exit. As they go, the elf notes how much things have changed, and Durin says 20 years will do that, and we've come to the crux of his beef. Apparently, these once close friends have not seen each other in two decades, and the suggestion here seems to be that Elrond, who is immortal, barely seemed to notice because to such a being, 20 years isn't very long. And it was in this time that Elrond not only failed to see his friend, 
but also missed his wedding and the birth of his two children. Now, I've seen some discussion on this topic about how time passes for an elf. Does a period like 20 years indeed seem like the blink of an eye? I tend to side with those who say this idea is silly. Elves may be immortal, but they do exist within time. So any comparison one might be tempted to make with, say, the God of the Bible, for whom one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day, doesn't really hold water since God does not exist within time, but rather is eternal. 20 years might be a small portion of an elf's potential lifespan, but it would still pass as 20 years and feel like 20 years. Now, one could argue that elves, within the confines of their own relationships with one another, might view 20 years apart as not so big a deal because of how expansive their own lives tend to be. And I think there's enough information to at least assume that elves tend to befriend members of their own race almost exclusively, meaning they might be accustomed to these long periods of absence. I think the show perhaps could have established a norm such as this when Elrond was reunited with Galadriel during the first episode, as it's very possible the two hadn't seen one another for many, many years. But alas, they never state specifically how long those two had been apart. And even if they had, we'd still have the issue of why Elrond missed his friend's wedding when it's implied that he was invited to attend, as well as why he missed out on the births of Durin's children. To sum up, I think the show could have justified, at least to some extent, why Elrond's treatment of this relationship wasn't mere laziness or anything malicious, but rather a misunderstanding based on the customs of his people. Yet they've ultimately failed to do so because it seems they weren't willing to do all of the necessary legwork in the writing room. And not only that, I have to wonder if this little bit of beef between these two will mean anything in the episodes to come, or if it was just some contrived way of filling out some of the episode with the endurance test. Elrond apologizes and congratulates Durin on his wife and family and expresses that he would like to apologize to them personally, to which the dwarf agrees, though he tells him that there will be no reminiscing and no staying for dinner. Then his wife, Princess Disa, enters the room and recognizes that this must be Elrond, who it would appear she's heard much about. Greeting him warmly, she of course invites him to stay for dinner. The couple has a little back and forth, and then their children enter the room playing with some of Durin's things, and it is admittedly a sweet introduction to his family. It's the type of introduction that will likely feel very familiar in terms of method, but is tried and true and effective nonetheless in endearing us to them. How touching. Elrond takes in the happy scene and also notices a tree inside of the home which resembles one scene in his own homeland. They all have dinner, and Disa recounts the story of how she and her husband met and fell in love, and Durin makes sure to throw in that Elrond should have been at the wedding. The elf then makes mention of the sapling, saying that this was something he gave to Durin. Disa says that he tends to it as though it is a third child, implying that Durin's friendly feelings toward Elrond haven't fully subsided. And all of this, I was perfectly fine with. It worked to develop these characters, gave us some insight into their relationships, is more or less written well, and the actors are all doing a very good job. Yes, even Deesa's actress, the one who was annoyingly going on and on about dwarves of color in countless press events and interviews, making me want to slip a rod through my ears, is performing very well in her role thus far. But then of course, as with all moments in this show that I enjoy, we are doused with a bit of cringe. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. You know, I almost sort of liked Elrond in the first episode. His attempts to talk sense into Galadriel amidst her nonsense was much appreciated, but here? This was a nice moment, and those have been few and far between, and lines like that make the experience akin to reading a nice short story and then turning over to the end paper and discovering someone has wiped their six o'clock with it. Elrond then makes to leave, thanking his hosts for their hospitality. But then Durin tells him to sit down and make his proposal so he can decide whether he'll present it to his king or toss it in to the nearest slag pit. And thus ends what I would call thus far the best overall scene of the show. Better. Not good, but better. But now we return to the sea with Galadriel and her new friend Sauron, whom I'll humor and call Halbrand. He tells her she need not keep her distance while she wonders aloud what type of man abandons his companions to die, to which he replies, Why be part of the larger target? You're a target still. I think these two lines are funny in their own way, 
Halbrand's because, once again, he's betraying his true identity, as Sauron left his legions of orcs, the larger target in that case, to remain hidden. Galadriel's is amusing because she says he is a target still, as if that somehow pokes a hole in his logic. And yet he didn't suggest being a smaller target eliminated the danger, but rather mitigated it. And he's correct, regardless of what one might think morally about such a decision. Halbrand then questions whether she's a deserter and whether she's running to or from something. Do I have the look of a deserter? You don't have the look of someone to whom things happen by accident. Oh, 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 I cannot believe these writers actually had the audacity to put those words in anyone's mouth in regard to Galadriel of all people, especially after what we've witnessed in this episode. She responds that her duty demanded she return to Middle-earth. No what have elves ever done to you? Do you blame us for your being stranded here? Galadriel behaving like a C-word C-word here seems a little bit strange to me. I understand why she doesn't exactly trust Halbrand, but at the same time, he did save her life and even said she need not keep her distance. Why she would think he blames her people for him being stranded right now doesn't really make a lot of sense. I know it was shown in episode 1 that the humans in the Southlands and the elves who occupy it have a bit of bad blood. However, it also seemed to be established that this animosity was specific to that region because it had sided with Morgoth during the war. Surely not all humans did this. And yet this episode seems to be carrying over the hostilities between these two groups and not explaining why. Halbrin responds by saying he blames orcs, not elves for being driven away from his homeland. She then presses him over the whereabouts of this place, seemingly believing he could be the key to finding her enemy. Oh, if she only knew. Also, I found this little flash in her mind that showed the sigil of Sauron curious since the connection between the orcs and Sauron is obvious, which would make this seem unnecessary. It's really funny how this show will hold your hand with simple things such as this, but offer no explanation for its more outlandish happenings. Halbren tells her he's from the Southlands, and uh, I cannot help but chuckle a bit because when she found the sigil in Sauron's northern stronghold in the previous episode, her idea was that she and her company of elves should continue north since the sigils must represent a trail. And putting aside the idiocy of that notion, it confirms that had they listened to her, there's a good chance that she would have led some, most, or possibly all of them to their deaths, or at the very least on a fruitless journey toward nothing. But of course, the writers likely don't want you to remember her awful lapse in judgment. Frankly, I'm not sure even they remember. She asks for details regarding the enemy's numbers and under whose banner they marched, and then demands he takes her to their last known location. I wonder why she thought he'd simply agree to do this for her without any incentive. And you know, I'm certainly glad for the smaller helpings of this character in episode 2, but they've done nothing in this time to enhance her image. Back in the Southlands, we catch up with Bronwyn, who is running back to her home to warn the citizens, which she is apparently able to do just by heading to the town tavern. Are there no authority figures here? A mayor or governor, perhaps? I suppose the elves were in charge beforehand, but did they not install anyone in a position of leadership to whom Bronwyn might be able to appeal? We're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. Bronwyn warns about the missing townsfolk of Hordern, as well as the tunnels which head in their direction, and that to remain would be perilous. She's cut off when Waldrig slams down his knife and says he's seen landslides less dangerous than a wayward tongue, and that he will not tolerate such rumors. Wait, is Waldrig the tavern owner, the town authority, or are these simply the rules in his bar? Then again, who am I to judge their leadership when my own country is run by one of the common enemies from the Resident Evil franchise? Bronwyn persists because, as she states, and as I noted a moment ago, the elves have left them alone to fend for themselves, though Waldrig states this to be a relief, at least for most of them. This is said with more than a hint of disapproval, and Bronwyn's reaction to him is rather curious. She turns suddenly and notices that everyone's looking at her, and it's treated like some kind of revelation. Now, given the fuss she's been making, it shouldn't surprise her that everyone's attention is on the conversation between herself and Waldrig. And yet, for some reason, she seems to make a connection between their staring and his statement, as if this is evident of a shared disapproval of her, well, stringing a Rondir's bow. Now, I do understand why they want to make such a point, but they really fail to justify it. 
Now, this could have easily been fixed by letting another character chime in with his or her distaste of her fraternizations, followed by a collective murmur of agreement from everyone else. But instead, they saw fit to rely upon a very sudden, meaningful look which ironically should contain no meaning at all. Bronwyn's son, Theo, is now shown back at home staring into a fire. He hears some rather loud scraping beneath the floorboards, which calls back to his complaint about rats in the first episode. Turns out that has a payoff and that what he was hearing was actually orcs, which proves the tunnels were indeed leading toward the town. And it just so happens the home they're discovered in is the home of the person warning everyone. Boy, this show is really stacking up the coincidences, isn't it? But before we can learn what happens to Theo, we're back with the Rondir, foolishly crawling through the tunnels because he doesn't know what's down there. He hears a pursuer coming his way, then crawls and swims as fast as he can to a defensible position where he then draws his blade. But as he is fixated upon the water, the show attempts a jump scare as some hands emerge from the vines at his back and grab him, pulling him out of sight. Meanwhile, Bronwyn comes home to find much of the inside to be a wreck, along with a large hole in the floorboards. Her son, who has locked himself behind a small and fragile door, opens it so she can know that he is safe, but also urges her to keep quiet. He whispers for her to go and get help, but then they hear something coming from inside the hole. She moves toward the door to leave him, but then looks back at her son's hiding place and decides she cannot abandon him, and makes to hide herself instead. And this is all really stupid. Based on the destruction about their home, it can be assumed the orc has already attempted an attack on Theo. So why then did it go back down into the hole when it's about to attack again? Also, there are some rather large scratches around that door where Theo is hiding. You're telling me the orc broke it down that much only to give up? Worst of all, why when Bronwyn understood there was a threat did she not immediately take her son and get the heck out of the house? There was more than enough time. You were a terrible mother! Well, because danger needed to be manufactured, you silly goose, that's why. The orc emerges from the plot hole, looking impressively monstrous, I'll admit, but also behaving moronically. It briefly lingers outside the door where Theo is hiding, but then keeps aimlessly walking around the house. Only when something gives away Bronwyn's hiding spot does it attempt to attack her, but her son is quick to emerge from his hiding place and stab the monster in the back. What is it like being stabbed? It was the single most painful experience of my life. What was the second most painful? The orc slashes at him, but then Mommy tells him to run, which prompts the orc to throw a table toward the window, which Theo might have been able to get out of, and I'm not making this up, the table props itself up perfectly to block the exit while hitting him at the same time. Bronwyn gets the creature's attention and draws a knife, but it continues to try and go after the boy for some reason. Bronwyn then picks up a larger blade, or blade-like weapon, and runs the beast through, but it's still not enough to bring it down, and again, it continues to go after Theo. Does this thing not recognize the bigger threat in the room? And with its focus on the lesser threat, Bronwyn is able to grab another weapon and finally behead the beast. We don't really see where this item comes from, or even what exactly it is, but we'll assume her home simply has these things on hand for possible orc slaying, I guess. Worth noting, we don't actually see the act of beheading, as it instead cuts directly to Bronwyn setting the head of the orc down on the table in the tavern, thus proving to the townsfolk that she was right and they were wrong. <laughs> this whole sequence is just silly and cringe. I mean, I guess it's a little funny that she hasn't managed to catch her breath in however many minutes it's been since the fight, but laughing at rather than with this show isn't exactly an endorsement. Bronwyn declares that if any of the townsfolk want to live, then they'll make for the tower at first light. Come with me if you want to live. Back at sea, Galadriel and Halbrand are battling through a furious storm on their makeshift raft. Our heroine ends up in the water, tied to the sail which she tried to anchor herself to, but Halbrand manages to save her life by cutting her free with Fenrod's blade. And once they're back on the raft, the scene ends. Well, that wasn't very much, was it? Wonder what the point of all that was. Back with Nori and Poppy, they come upon V. Gandalf just kind of standing and breathing in the air as if he is taking in the sweet serenity of nature. Nori tells him that her people will be migrating away in a few days and that she had hoped to help him, and yet she cannot. 
He obviously doesn't understand what they're saying, but he does take notice of their lanterns, which Poppy says contain fireflies. Why go to all the trouble of capturing hundreds of bugs for some light when fire exists? Ah, I see. They do so because it offers up an opportunity for a visual and some mystery, as being in Vigandoff's presence emboldens the bugs to escape the lanterns and fly about him. He even begins to speak to them. Then they fly up in a formation that resembles a constellation in the sky, somehow understanding perfectly Nori's point of view so she can see them rest in the air at the exact spots where the stars would otherwise be seen. This is some really specific magic, I must say. Nori says that this must be how they help him, by finding these stars. Which means what exactly? Does he need to travel in their direction? I mean, I think they can just point him in a certain way if that's the case. Otherwise, I'm really not sure what's going on here. The effort of V. Gandalf's little magical display causes him to fall down in exhaustion, much as he did at the beginning of the episode. But this time, it also has the ominous effect of killing all of the insects. Poppy seems strangely horrified by this, even shedding a tear. Which is really funny when you think about it. I mean, they were your lantern slaves a moment ago, and I'm supposed to believe you're sad? Oh, and of course, the music is now being all spooky again, as they're doing the thing where we're supposed to believe he could be Sauron. You're not fooling anyone, you know. Back at Casa Doom, Prince Durin is seen speaking with his father, King Durin. Uh, one is the third, the other one's the fourth. We'll just call him the king and him the Durin. The Durin assures his father that Elrond doesn't know, though it isn't specified what he's referring to. The king says perhaps, though Durin's had a soft spot for the elves, and that it is too much of a coincidence that an elf would show up now. But Durin insists that he knows Elrond well enough to know when he's hiding something, but the king says maybe he knew you'd know. Oh, I know that. And I knew you'd know I'd know you knew. But I didn't. I only knew that you'd know that I knew. Did you know that? Of course. Tedious exchange aside, it all leads up to a bit of Pulp Fiction where we see a case containing a shiny object hidden from view. So either the dwarves have found some powerful treasure, or they're mining something valuable and or powerful. The latter seems more likely to me, and I suspect it could be Mithril. But we shall see in due time. Moving right along, Theo is shown uncovering the evil sword hilt from episode 1. Though this time, as he is holding it, some blood escapes the wound he received from the orc, and it begins crawling up his hand and onto the blade, which subsequently begins to smoke and flame as it starts to rebuild itself. I wonder if back when it was a whole sword, it used to keep getting bigger and bigger as the user stabbed people. Bronwyn calls for Theo, and he proceeds to wrap up the blade. Then, once he's joined her, they and the rest of the townsfolk make to head for safety. Now, I noted in episode 1 how abruptly this sword hilt was introduced and how no explanation was given as to how Theo came across it in the first place, or who it even belonged to. And honestly, this would be the perfect opportunity to unveil that person's identity. Aside from being a dangerous item, the hilt is also a stolen one. Given that the townsfolk are now evacuating, it would stand to reason that whomever it belongs to would have gone to retrieve it and realized it was missing. Unless this someone is staying behind and simply not keeping a close eye on it, this lack of a development is quite the missed opportunity. But perhaps it will be rectified in an episode to come. And now we come back to Galadriel and Halbran for the episode's final scene. Thank God. We find them asleep on their raft, exhausted from having survived the previous night's storm. Footsteps can be heard, and then a shadow appears. As it turns out, they've either floated their way over to a ship and bumped into it, or the vessel spotted them and has just come up alongside their raft. Either way, we have yet another preposterous coincidence on our hands. Seriously, Galadriel is like a magnet to convenient solutions. She literally has just floated her way to a rescue boat while she was asleep. Of course, as to whether or not those aboard are friend or foe, that is a question apparently for the next episode, as this one has thankfully reached its end. It's done. Now, before we continue with my overall thoughts on this chapter of Rings of Power, I'd like to show some quotes from a few reviews I've read about it. Keith Phillips of Vulture stated in his that, the second episode has to do less heavy exposition lifting than the first episode, but it's not free of it either. 
Yet by the end of the episode the rings of power has started to pick up a real sense of momentum. Has it now? Is that momentum forwards or backwards? Juliet Harrison, meanwhile, says, There is so much to enjoy here, not to mention it's seriously beautiful to look at, and as the pace distinctly picks up in episode 2 we can be confident that it will continue to do so through the next few episodes as well. Overall, we're intrigued and excited about watching the next episode, and that's exactly what the early episodes of a new show should do. 4 out of 5 stars. You gotta be fucking kidding. So, she agrees with Keith about the aforementioned momentum. Interesting. And a 4 out of 5 star rating. That's quite lofty. But now, let's see what Alex Stedman of IGN.com, whose score I alluded to in my previous video, has to contribute. To give you an idea of the disparity in the two parts of the premiere, this review's score covers them as a whole, but if I were to score each episode separately, the first would get a 7, for good, and the second would get a resounding 9, for amazing. With the setup out of the way, the second episode is able to plunge us into this world, its relationships, and even play with some of the kind of humor and banter that's so beloved in The Lord of the Rings. You think the setup was out of the way after episode 1? All I saw in this episode was more setup. Galadriel has a new lead on Sauron but hasn't begun to pursue it. Nori has a lead on how to help V. Gandalf but hasn't begun to do so. Elrond now has someone to help him with the task Celebrimbor and King Gilgalad have assigned him. Bronwyn is about to start heading for safety, and Arondir is heading for hardship. And I have no inherent issue with using multiple episodes for the purpose of setup, but to suggest that we're in the midst of these characters' journeys rather than simply watching them being pointed in the directions they are to head, which would seem to qualify as setup, is just factually inaccurate. But hey, what do I know? We'll just lean on the experts, guys. Just put on your NPC helmets and repeat after me. Episode 2 picks up the momentum, plunges us into the world, delivers on the relationships and humor, and we can all be confident and excited going forward. Oh, to have the bar set that low. You know, there is a quote I'm reminded of from The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis, in which it is said, Now, the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. These types of reviews seem to be indicative of this very phenomena. To hand an episode like this 4 out of 5 stars, or a 9 out of 10, or to act like it has some momentum takes a mental gymnastics routine that very few brains are naturally limber enough to achieve. I get that when viewing media, particularly of the fantasy genre, one must suspend their disbelief to a certain extent, but to deny it entirely is not supposed to be a part of the mandate. Ted Bundy, while incarcerated, received numerous love letters from adoring women because of how attractive he was to them. And I kinda think these glowing reviews were being handed out to Rings of Power for a similar reason. And before anyone cries foul over me attacking people just for liking something I don't, take a chill pill and store that notion into your bonus holes. Whether or not these critics or any of you out there actually like Rings of Power is not my present concern. I like plenty of movies and shows that have enough holes in their plots to be mistaken for a January 6th indictment. My problem is that these so-called critics are not critiquing. Aside from pretending that this show represents high fantasy, which is a low fantasy in and of itself, they refuse to acknowledge how impossibly coincidental the events of this show happen to be, or how poorly written the characters and dialogue are. And while we're at it, can we all just agree that any favorable comparisons to Peter Jackson's trilogy should be met with absolute contempt and maybe a few torches and pitchforks? But wait a minute, you may say. You haven't quoted anyone making favorable comparisons to Lord of the Rings? Correct, dear viewer. I have saved that for now because this wasn't part of those reviews so many months ago. This was more recent. Good old Screen Rant recently put out their list of things Rings of Power does better than The Lord of the Rings, and it's a great impression of Amber Heard's favorite bedroom activity. No surprise that very high on their list is that the show does diversity better, paying no mind to the fact that one has to ignore the makeup of Tolkien's world, or how most countries don't tend to look like you just stepped outside of a California residence. But the funniest and most telling parts of the list are their number one and number seven entries. At the top of their list is that there's just more stories, as if quantity trumps quality. But more amusing than that is this entry, where they praise the show for making Elrond kinder and less critical than Hugo Weaving's version. Because of course they'd value kindness over being critical. 
After all, faux kindness and the value of fake diversity is sort of all that matters to many of these so-called critics. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to paint for you a scenario. I, for one, happen to be a big fan of the movie Once Upon a Time in Mexico, the third entry in Robert Rodriguez's El Mariachi trilogy, and it was a film he made after his buddy Quentin Tarantino told him on the set of Desperado that this was his Dollars trilogy, and that he'd need to make a third one, make it epic, and call it Once Upon a Time in Mexico. I have probably seen this movie at least a couple dozen times. The music, the action, the gunplay, Johnny Depp it is coolest, the smoking hotness of Salma Hayek, the whole package adds up to a film I find to be immensely entertaining. Yet despite this, I maintain the self-awareness to realize that I am likely in the 1% of people who enjoy it that much because it's an incredibly ridiculous movie that objectively, I'd be unlikely to hand a high score. So despite it being a personal favorite, I'd be more than a tad reluctant to ever recommend Once Upon a Time in Mexico on a broad scale, because I know that only certain people are likely to appreciate it in a way similar to myself. But what if I ignored all of its issues and went purely based on how I feel about it? Imagine me actually having the gall to make suggestively favorable comparisons to the final entry in Sergio Leone's Dollars trilogy, as if the few things Robert Rodriguez's film may have done better than The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly might actually make it better. I think we can agree that would be irresponsible to say the least. But just as egregious as that would be putting out what I claim to be an honest review of that film where I ignored all of its faults and spoke only of its merits, followed by giving it a score that represented my feelings for it rather than its actual quality. I mean, sure, unlike Rings of Power, at least that movie actually has merits worth speaking of. But if someone calls themselves a critic or slaps the word review on their article or video, then how about living up to those nouns and doing an actual review with actual substantive claims? And to think, these people get mad when they're called shills. Now, as fun as it is to take the piss out of outlets such as these, and as much as that adds to the satisfaction of doing the same to one of the shows they're selling, I don't want to overcorrect because of them. My jab about the show having no merits to speak of is sarcasm. It's not actually true. There are, in fact, improvements in this episode over the first enough to make it good or to make the prospect of watching any of the episodes that follow exciting? Absolutely not. But still, a positive is a positive. So let's end this video with those. Despite the activist actress playing her, I thought Disa was fairly charming in her first appearance and thought the relationship between herself and Durin was rather sweet to watch. And speaking of Durin, his actor, Owen Arthur, also does mostly good work here, though he is given a spotty line from time to time. Kella Brimbor, despite looking as though he'd be more at home being a judge on a reality show rather than working in a forge, is performed quite good by Charles Edwards thus far. So at least for now, he doesn't have to endure me saying he's wearing blacksmith face. But aside from these solid performances, a decent plot thread or two, and the surface elements like special effects, part two of Rings of Power is otherwise at least as gourd awful as the chapter that preceded it. In fact, there's an argument to be made that it's worse. While it has more enjoyable elements than its predecessor, its storytelling relies so much on luck and coincidence that it feels world-breaking when it's all said and done. I wondered at the beginning of the video if the show had bottomed out already and if it could begin to dig itself out of the hole starting here. Well, it hasn't. I could argue that in some ways it has slowed its descent, but it remains like the stone in Finrod's silly lesson, seeing only downward and sinking further into the abyss. Well, that's all I have for you today. I thank you so much for your time. It is always appreciated. God bless you, and Gordspeed.